Welcome to another edition of Tales of the Workshop. Today, we're going to feature how to create electricity using a DC compound generator, but we're going to be using a synchronous motor to provide us with the turning force necessary to generate electricity. Remember that we need three items to create electricity. We need turns of wire, a turning force, as well as magnetism. Now, the turns of wire are already set up inside of our DC machine. The synchronous motor is going to provide us with a turning force and the magnetism is going to be generated internally, meaning we're going to use some residual magnetism that pre-exists inside of the pole pieces of our, our DC generator and we're going to be using a rheostat to help control or let us fine tune our output voltage. Stay tuned. We're going to get set up and we'll be right back. Our workstation is set up in the following manner. I've actually have got a DC voltmeter that's going to be registering the value of output voltage generated by my DC, my DC machine. This amp meter is going to register the amount of field excitation current that we need to create the magnetic field inside of the machine to create electricity. And this amp meter is going to register the output current of the machine for the electricity we are going to create. Now, in order to get current flow, I need a closed circuit. That closed circuit is going to come from this variable resistance module. By adding resistance selectively placed, what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the output voltage and we're going to study the relationship between the field excitation current versus the output voltage and current, or commonly known as power. What we're going to do is we're going to turn on our power supply and we're going to get our synchronous machine up and running. Now I gotta wait before I turn on the DC excitation current. Now the synchronous machine was used specifically because of the fact that it offers us a very stable speed. Meaning once I get this running with our three phase power AC I'm going to turn on DC excitation current and I'm going to lock the rotor in step with the frequency of our applied voltage, meaning it's going to run at 1800 RPM. Now we are going to be using AC amp meters connected to each of the three phases because I want to monitor the amount of torque that we're putting on the motor as we are generating more and more power. We will be talking about this concept called counter torque. Now, counter torque is basically the opposition or the drag force created by our generator on the motor. So I'm going to switch microphones so that you can hear me a little bit better today as we're going through because we're going to be creating a lot of noise. So I'll be right back after I switch out my microphones. Right now, our first step is going to be to turn on our synchronous machine. First things first. Now we're going to turn on our excitation current. Now we can see that the amp meter, the motor is running at 1800 RPM and it's registering its lowest value of current. Now let's take a look at my DC generator. We're setting it up. I am reading 120 volts. Now, I set it using this uh, rheostat that allowed me to adjust the field excitation current going to the shunt field to optimize it. So if I adjust it, you can see that it went down to 100 volts. And so what I'm going to do is allow for more current flow to the shunt field, increasing excitation current, which will directly, by increasing the magnetic field, I'm going to increase the output voltage. You'll notice I have no current output. The reason I don't have any current output is because I have nothing to draw the current out of the machine. That's where the resistive module is going to come into play now. With the short shunt connection, why we are doing this is because I want to be able to demonstrate to people that the short shunt connection allows the series field of a generator to have a little bit more control and it'll automatically compensate when there is a large current demand 
on the generator. That being said, when I start turning on my resistors, what we should see is that there's going to be a slight increase in the output voltage where it is automatically compensating. So let's have a look. I'm going to put in 1200 ohms of resistance. Let's have a look at our voltage. Now, there is a very slight increase. Now, we're going to set it up for a little bit of a, um, a zoom so we can actually get a better look at what's going on. Now, 1200, 2400 ohms, or in parallel, we can see that we are registering a current flow and that the voltage is starting to increase slightly. As I add more resistance in parallel, I'm actually putting less resistance in the circuit, allowing for more current flow. Again, I'm reading almost 125 volts with an increase of about 0.3 amperes, but you'll notice that my field excitation current hasn't changed. The amount of current being drawn by my synchronous motor is not increasing. So let's continue. Again, the voltage is increasing. Also, what we are seeing is an automatic increase in the field excitation current. This is attributed to the fact that when I've got more current flow coming out of the generator, automatically I'm getting more current flow running through the series field that is actually increasing the, the, uh, the internal magnetic field generated to allow us to increase our output voltage. And again, let's keep a look. Um, <clears throat> let's maintain our focus on the amp meters to see that the synchronous motor is starting to labor. It's drawing more current. As you can see, I've just closed another switch and the current is going up incrementally as well as the output current and voltage coming from the generator. We are registering and slight increase in the field excitation current. Again, more current flow means then that I've got a stronger magnetic field in the armature as well as in the series field to help compensate. Now, I'm gonna turn these off and we can see the current's coming up, and look, right here it becomes the breaking point. This is the concept of counter torque. The machine is drawing more voltage and current than the synchronous motor can provide horsepower. The only way to fix this is to back off some of the resistance. Let's do a quick recap of what just happened. What we saw was that when we were increasing progressively the amount of current and voltage that the DC generator could generate, what we saw was that internally, the more current that was flowing from the armature, it also strengthened the internal magnetic field of both the armature as well as the series field. And what that was doing is that it was providing what we would call a counter torque or a drag force that the synchronous motor had to be able to generate power to drive through. We were, and this is the reason why we have the amp meters. The amp meters were registering how hard or uh, how much current the motor was drawing in order to provide us with that turning force. Now, as we hit that breaking point, the breaking point was when we were actually seeing that the synchronous motor was drawing maximum amounts of current and it could either have been damaged or burnt out. Did the generator have a more capacity available to it that it could have delivered more voltage and current? Yes, it did. Our problem was is that we did not have a motor with sufficient horsepower where the torque to drive through the counter torque being exhibited by our DC generator and that became the issue. How do we solve it? I needed to find 
a synchronous machine that's got more horsepower. Unfortunately, that is not available to me with the current system that I'm working with. But it is a very important learning outcome is that the short shunt compound connection allows the series field a lot of control and it allows us to create a generator or a wire generator that will actually compensate for slight increases in demand specifically for current. The voltage is something we want to maintain at a very specific level. And what we saw is that when we were drawing progressively more amounts of current, the voltage increased. Now, you know, in the grand scheme of things, why would we be interested in seeing a generator that its voltage would increase when we have more demand? Because of the fact that it allows us I can compensate for line loss. One of the major reasons why direct current was never seen widespread uh, appeal and why Nikola Tesla's alternating current system became ultimately the standard the world over for power generation is that it did not suffer from line loss the way direct current system does. Now, knowing that direct current suffers from line loss, that allows me as maybe the operator who is generating direct current to compensate for it for the long distance that uh, direct current may have to travel to get to its customer. So there's something to be said about why do we want to overcompensate or over compound a generator? I want to be able to offset losses in the line. Now, stay tuned, we're gonna come back and we're gonna explore the long shunt compound connection. Now, in this segment, what we're going to do is we're going to explore the long shunt connection. Now, what that means is that the shunt field winding of the generator is wired independently or in parallel with the armature and the series field. And that's going to produce some very different results. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to turn on the synchronous machine. I'm going to switch out, uh, switch out my microphone so that you can hear me despite all of the background noise. So let's go ahead and get our synchronous machine started. Now we are going to be turning in the clockwise rotation, adding our excitation current. There we go. Our current on our synchronous motor is drawing the lowest value of current. And currently, I'm going to set up our resistance module and I'm going to adjust the field excitation current to the shunt field to get a proper 120 volts. You'll see that my field excitation current is almost 300 milliamps. I am generating 120 volts but I am not generating any current, at least not yet because I don't have anything to draw the current we have to insert resistance into the circuit. So here goes. We're going to start off with the 1200 ohm switch. Let's have a look at what's going to happen here on our voltmeter. The current is staying uh, stable. We are registering a current increase. And you'll notice that the voltage is just climbing up ever so slightly. We're seeing an increase in current. My magnetic, uh, my magnetic flux or the shunt field current is staying steady, but it is increasing slightly. We're noticing that the current drawn by our synchronous motor is starting to increase. So let's go ahead. I'm going to start closing the 600 ohm switches next. We can see that we're drawing almost a full ampere of current from the generator. We've seen that our, our shunt field current, which is the, ma uh, the magnetic field, is staying pretty stable at 300 milliamps, and that the voltage has climbed ever so slightly. We're just at about 126 volts. As I increase the resistance or the current draw,
we can see that the motor is starting to struggle. That is because of the fact that our generator is creating a counter torque. The more current we see on the output, the stronger the internal magnetic field is getting and the motor is starting to struggle against it. The motor provides us with torque or a turning force. The generator is actually generating a drag force or a counter torque. And let's see, add a little bit more resistance and look, we've just hit our tipping point. Our synchronous motor can no longer generate it and if I don't start backing off, we're going to damage things. Now, according to textbooks, when we control the level of compounding, both with the long shunt and short shunt connection, we can result with three possible scenarios. I can either have a flat compounded motor, an over compounded motor, or a under compounded motor. The fact is, is that because I was able to maintain the voltage within 5%, of our target voltage of 120 volts, this would be considered a flat compounded comp uh, uh, connection. And the, uh, the series field was not tampered with, meaning that I never made any adjustments to the series field. So when we were drawing more current, obviously any current that was generated through the armature had to flow through the series field and that helped to strengthen the internal magnetic field of the series field windings, increasing the magnetic flux. That's one of the reasons why we saw a slight increase here, and it helped uh, compensate for things, but not by much. Now, let's have a look at the different scenario. What if I was able to put in resistance in parallel with the series field, and if I was to selectively start weakening that series field, what would be the, the outcome on the output voltage of our generator? So I'm going to be right back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wire in a rheostat that's going to allow us to control the amount of current flowing through that series field winding. And let's see what effect, if any, it'll have on the output voltage and the current generated by the generator. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to take this digital multimeter and I'm going to calibrate the rheostat that we're going to wire in parallel with the series field. So we're going to go ahead and adjust it. Now according to the lab, they'd like to see about 6.4 ohms. I have to confess the rheostat is extremely uh, touchy and I've been able to get it. Well, 6.8, then anywhere between 6.8 and 7 ohms. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to wire this in parallel with the series field. The theory is, is that I'm going to shunt some of the current away from the series field so that it's not going to have as much influence on the generator when we start to draw more current. And the result should be that the voltage output from the generator is going to taper off as we progressively are trying to draw more current from the system. The generator will not be able to sustain the voltage for very, very long before it actually starts to drop off. That's the theory. So let's put this into practice. So here we go. We're going to start up the synchronous machine. We're going to plug in the DC excitation current and we are now going to start phasing in resistance. Let's have a look and examine our voltage. Now I'm going to calibrate the voltage. So we're getting 120, about 300 milliamps of field excitation current and we have no current output. Now let's start bringing in some resistance. 
we can see the current is starting to climb. I'm seeing a slight decrease in the field excitation current. My voltage is holding pretty steady. But what I predict is going to happen is as I start drawing a bit more current, the voltage is going to start to fall. And there we see it. The voltage is starting to sag the more we're drawing current from the machine. Now you'll notice that the synchronous machine, the motor is starting to struggle. It's starting to increase in its current rating. Now I'm going to bring this down and go to 100 ohms. And we can see that we've dropped to about 115 volts. My field excitation current has dropped slightly, but I'm drawing more current. And the trend will continue. The more current I draw, the more the voltage starts to drop. Now, I'm probably going to hit the tipping point here. So I'm down to 110. My field excitation current has dropped off a little bit, but my uh, I'm still registering increases in current. I might hit the tipping point right here. I'm close. Voltage is still dropping, and there we go. I just hit the tipping point. The voltage is dropped, field excitation current, and I've maxed out the current output. What we've seen is that by putting resistance in parallel with the series field, it acted like a current shunt and we were actually redirecting some of the current away from the series field and that weakened it as we were trying to draw more current from the armature. What was happening is we weren't getting any kind of automatic compensation and what we did see is that we were registering that the voltage or the voltage output was progressively getting lower and lower. And we have to be mindful of this because of the fact that according to uh, the electrical code, we're supposed to be able to have no more than 5% uh, voltage drop from the point of distribution in a home. Meaning, I've got to make sure if I'm the utility, I'm supplying electricity at exactly 120 volts because at the furthest point in a home, we can see no more than 5% voltage drop. Otherwise, we're going to have devices that will not function properly. And that is a major concern to the consumer or your customer that's buying electricity. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed today's presentation on the DC generator. Uh, I felt it was really important to be able to showcase what are some of the variables that can affect the output voltage of a machine, as well as demonstrating certain principles of how power generation can be controlled. Ultimately, in industry, how do we control the output voltage of a generator, whether it's alternating current or direct current, is we will control the excitation current or the magnetic strength of the field that will directly influence the output voltage. According to textbooks, they mentioned the number of turns of wire and the turning force. The problem is, is when we start playing with the turning force, the synchronous machine was chosen specifically because it gave us a very stable output in terms of the speed. I wanted it at a very consistent rate because if we start adjusting the speed, what we could unintentionally do is we start affecting the frequency of the voltage. Now, it is more important in AC, but it does affect the waveform or the ripple of the DC waveform, and that can cause us problems. So it is a standard practice in industry. We will adjust the output voltage via the excitation current. Once we've got the speed set, and usually that's how it's done, we've got a calculation, we figure out what is the speed that we need to achieve the desired voltage, we set it, then we kind of forget about it. And then we start concentrating on excitation current. So thank you for participating. If you enjoy these videos, please consider liking and subscribing. And until next time, please stay safe.